So I work at a specialized seniors clinic doing comprehensive geriatric assessment on, on patients being sent in by folks like you for problems like cognitive impairment and falls and frailty and failure to thrive and so on. So as part of my assessment, I need um, a good uh, comprehensive but efficient physical examination. And, and that's what I want to show you today is the examination that I do. The other objective is really just to get you folks starting to think about your own physical examinations, your own complete physicals that you do in the office. I think it's, it's significant that um, after 30 some years of attending these CME meetings, I have never yet attended any talk about the physical examination. Maybe a regional examination like the, the shoulder or knee, but I've never seen a talk on, on the complete physical. And yet it's something we do, all of us, every day. So why don't we talk about it? Why don't we review it? So I'd kind of like you guys to start looking at your own physicals and saying, well, what makes sense for you and your, and your patients? What, what gives us the yield? And, and, and should we be doing a more comprehensive ex examination? Okay, so I, what I plan to do is take you through my routine physical. So this is the examination that I would give to every patient that I see uh, for a comprehensive geriatric assessment. Sometimes there are add-ons, but this would be the basic minimum examination that, that I would do on each uh, patient. Over the years, my, my uh, examination has evolved. Um, I've added things, I've dropped things. So for instance, you know, for 30 years I was doing fundoscopy and after 30 years of doing this and getting absolutely nothing out of it, I decided to stop doing fundoscopy and, and I don't know why I didn't stop it er earlier on. Other things I've, I've added on, um, but I think um, I've kept it efficient by integrating it. Uh, so for instance, if you were to get a, a resident uh, or a medical student do it to do a uh, physical for you. You'll find that they start by doing a cardiovascular exam, head to toe, stand up, sit down, lie down, and then they do the neurologic examination, head to toe, stand up, sit down, lie down, um, and the poor patient is being tied up in, in, in knots during this examination. Um, and recently I, I asked the resident who was working with me to make sure you do a, a decent neurologic exam on this patient because the, the patient had a Parkinsonian syndrome. So she started uh, doing sensory examination, saying, do you feel this, 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 do you feel, you know, doing every dermatome in the body. Now, unless you're working on a spinal cord unit, I just don't see what the yield in that uh, would be. So I find the trick is find the items that have, have yield. Okay, so let's go through our examination uh, once, just at normal speed. And then maybe we'll go through it a second time and we can talk about the individual components of examination. And basically anything about the physical exam is, is on the table for, for discussion. So here's my patient today, Marnie. So first of all, Marnie, you'd come. I'm just gonna get you to walk down the hallway for me. So walk over there if you would. Okay, turn and come back now if you would. All right, that's wonderful. So come and stand, put your feet together, put your arms at your sides. Close your eyes and stand still. Okay, great. All right, come and have a seat on the edge of the bed here. So, Lauren, let's start by having a look in your ears. Right. And good. And now, if you would open your mouth wide for me. And say, ah, oh. ah, oh, that's great, thank you. And now take off your glasses and look me in the eyes. Good. And now look at my finger and follow it with your eyes. So follow it over this way and follow it over this way and follow it upwards and follow it downwards. Good, now look straight ahead at my nose and I want you to tell me every time you see one of my hands moving off in the corner. So point to the one that moves. Okay, show me your gums like this. Now stick out your tongue to the side, to the other side. Okay, great. I'm just going to come around behind you. I don't think I can go behind the bed in this case, so let me just do this way. Now, would you swallow for me, please? Okay. Turn your head this way. Turn your head the other way. Okay. 
Good. And now put your glasses on. And if you would, let me have your hands. Okay. Look over. Now hold your arms like that in front of you. Close your eyes and keep them still. Good. Now take my fingers in your hands and squeeze hard. Okay. Put your arms back like this. Put your arms out like that. Keep them there and don't let me pull down. Strong? Okay. Good. Bring them down. Now take your finger, touch my finger, and then your nose, and go back and forth quickly between the two. Okay, other hand, same thing. Okay, and now with your hands, do this. And let's go a little faster. Okay, that's wonderful. Okay, let's just check your pulse here. So tell me, ma'am, whereabouts do you live? Uh, Burnaby Mountain. Uh huh. Is that like a house or a condo or what? Uh, condo. Okay. The university. Great, thank you. Okay, just going to do your blood pressure now. Okay, and uh, would you stand up for me now? Wonderful, have a seat. Okay, now I'm just going to feel your heart, Marnie. Good. Good. And now take some deep breaths in and out through your mouth. Okay. Now we're just going to have to pretend on the next one because the next maneuver for me would be to have the patient recline at 45 degrees to do the jugular venous uh, pressure, but I can't do that on, on this bed. So let's just have you lie down now, Mike. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to feel your stomach. Now I'm going to feel these arteries in your in your groin area. Okay, and I'm going to check the circulation in your feet. And now let me take this leg and bend it up and let me turn it this way, turn it that way. And now hold it strong. Don't let me push it. Okay, and put it down. And now this one, bring it up. Let me turn it this way, that way. Hold it strong. Don't let me push. Now take this heel and I want you to run it in a straight line up and down this shin. Straight up and down. Great. And now the other one, straight up and down. Wonderful. Okay. Now point your feet upwards and keep them there strong and don't let me pull down. And now push down against my hands. That's great. Okay. Some reflexes. Let's just put your arms like so.
And now, Lauren, I'm going to stroke the bottom of your foot. Okay. And now, what I have here is a safety pin. Lauren, I'm going to touch you either with the sharp end of the pin or with the dull end of the pin. So, which end is this? And this? And this? And this? Good. Now, I'm going to move your big toe either up or down. So, which way is this? And which way is this? Okay, done. Come on, sit up here. You're, you're in wonderful health. So that's my examination. So let's talk about it. Um, any thoughts? What do you guys like to do? Um, you disagree with anything that I've done? Would you add in something that I haven't done, excluding things like pelvics and, and rectals and, and, and so on? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I didn't use mercury. That's aneroid. Oh, well, okay. So shouldn't we be using electronic devices? I don't think so. Do you, do you think we should be using an electronic device? Right. Okay, so a BP true machine. I, and I think that's, that's excellent. But I think that's for uh, following somebody with hypertension, really. Now, often I, I, I know people like you would set up your BP true and you'd leave the room and it takes six readings for you and, and that's an excellent way to go. But just on a, a one-off examination, like a screening examination, I think this would be just fine for my purposes on a screening examination. Yeah. And I think, you know, for a geriatrician, if there's one thing that defines a geriatrician, it's doing the blood pressure sitting and standing as, as opposed to other people. That's something that we always do. That's a very high yield maneuver for us. Okay, so maybe let's just go through it again and, and maybe talk about the, the bits and pieces of, of the examination. So come, now I, I started off uh, with walking, so if you just walk uh, over there and back for me. Okay, turn and come back. So I, I think this is an important part of the ex examination, especially for the elderly, and I'm actually deconstructing that walk as she's doing it. I'm looking at the degree of arm swing and the symmetry of the, of the arm swing. I'm looking at the stride length. I'm looking at the width of the of the base, and I'm looking at her turn when she made it on command. You know, is it a nice swift pivot or is it a choppy kind of, uh, of turn? Romberg, um, in the, yes, sir? I, I heard people say people get, get out of the chair before they walk and sit back in the chair. Is that yes, uh, and that, uh, in my setting, I, I do that because I'm interviewing them in one room examining them in another, and also I take them to the weigh scale, which is a sit-down uh, weigh scale. So, yes, uh, and so we look at the launch, what we call the launch, as they get up from the, from the chair to see whether they need to have the arms to push themselves up and whether they have that sort of Parkinsonian kind of, you know, one, two, three, um, and up. So, Romberg, so if you would stand with your feet together, and the feet have to be touching, arms at your side, close your eyes, and, and, and stand still. So with the elderly, you want to be careful with this because a lot of them, even with their eyes open, will, will keel over if they try to stand with their, their feet together. So do, do be vigilant with the elderly when it, when it comes to doing Romberg uh, tests. Okay, so come and have a, a seat on the, on the edge of the bed. Um, the ears, I don't think that's, that's anything we need to uh, discuss. Uh, the mouth and throat, I, I think I make myself actually look at individual items in there. I'd look at the quality of the teeth, and I do look at the tongue uh, to see if it's uh, red and shiny or, 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 or normal. And I do look at the palate to make sure the palate's symmetrical. So I make myself look at those individual items as I'm, as I'm doing the examination. I mentioned I dropped uh, fundoscopy, so if you take off your gloves. But I do check the pupils, both direct and consensual, and direct and consensual. And then I, I do the external ocular eye movements which isn't just about uh, cranial nerves, because it's also about the cortical control over eye movements. Do you have good smooth pursuit, or is it a jerky, saccadic kind of uh, pursuit that you see in various degenerative brain diseases? So just look at my finger and follow it with your eyes over here and here and up. And some conditions like uh, progressive supranuclear palsy will have very limited down gaze in, in, in particular. 
And then I do the field. So if you look straight ahead at my nose and tell me when you see one of my hands moving off in the corner. So I do it once on each side, basically, and then once to see if, if there's any neglect of a visual of the field. So even if they can do it on each side, then simultaneously presenting it will show us if there's any, any neglect. So then I, I feel for glands in the neck, and I feel for the carotid arteries while I'm there. And then I come around behind and I do the thyroid. Now this is, I find, one of my highest yield items is the thyroid. I think probably because nobody else examines the thyroid gland, or at least not, not properly. I find a lot of thyroid nodules, some of which turn out to be uh, cancers. And the only way to examine the thyroid, I'm convinced, is from behind. There's no way you can do it from the front. And so if you would swallow for me. OK. And then again, I'm integrating things like the musculoskeletal examination in with all the other examinations. And I run my hand down the spine, looking at it there. And then I percuss the bases, and just the bases, because that's where the fluid's going to be if it's going to be there. So then I come back, and I inspect the hands. And you know all the different things that one can see in, in hands, and I won't review that. And I do the drift. So hold your arms up in front of you, close your eyes, and keep them still. So no drift, and then the strength. So squeeze my fingers good and hard. Now put your arms back like this, and now put them out like that. Hold them strong, and don't let me pull down. So again, we've looked at shoulder joints, and we've looked at drift, and uh, we've looked at at strength as part of the CNS exam, so we're all integrating it in, in together. Now, my examination has to have quite a lot of neurology in it because I, I deal with neurodegenerative diseases uh, constantly, so your exam probably wouldn't have nearly the, the amount of neurology that, that, that mine does. So take your finger, touch my finger, and then your nose, and go back and forth between the two. Okay. And now the same with the other hand. So a test of primarily cerebellar uh, function. And now do this with your hands and speed it up. So the rapid alternating hand movements, again, cerebellar. But I, I, you know, I, I know there are three tests of cerebellar function in here because there's also the heel shin. But it's not at all unusual to find just one of those being positive in cerebellar disease, depending on whether it's midline cerebellum or, or, or uh, the, the lobes of the, of the cerebellum. OK, uh, so then I do the tone in the arms. And you heard, me, you heard me ask her about where she lived. This is the way to do tone, is at the wrist. But you really have to distract the patient when you do it. So just chatter away at something or other so they're not thinking about what you're doing down here at the, at the wrist. OK. So then I did the, the blood pressure sitting and, and, uh, and standing. And then I, I always feel for the point of maximal intensity to see if there's enlargement of the heart. I, I find that useful in, in my hands. Um, and then I listen, and I do a pulse rate at the, at the same time as I'm checking for heart sounds and murmurs. And then I do the carotids, the buoys. And I realize that, that carotid buoys are questionable. Uh, but what do you do when you find a carotid buoy? Because, well, first of all, these are the, the external carotids we're listening to, not the internal carotids uh, to begin with. And it's really the internal carotids that are, are, are important. But at least it's a marker of vascular disease for me. So I, 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 ha I haven't dropped it from the, the lineup. OK, I do the JVP at 45 degrees, but it really does have to be at 45 degrees. So you really need an examining table that will, will accomplish that for you. Now go ahead and lie back for me. So in, in doing the, the abdomen, I do make a point of, of feeling all through the abdomen. Um, but other things I, I think of, and I, I always deliberately roll my hand across the epigastrium, uh, thinking of the aorta. And I've, I've found lots of aortic aneurysms uh, that way over the years. I feel the femoral arteries, the pulsations, and then I listen over the femorals. And then I listen over the kidneys for renal breweries. I'm not actually listening for bowel sounds. I'm just listening for renal breweries. And then I come down and I do the, the, the pulses down here. So the dorsalis pedis pulses. 
and from the bottom is by far the best way of, of doing this. And of course, other things you happen to see at the same time is if there was a leg length discrepancy, you would see it right there at the, at the ankles. And if there were knee problems, you can examine them separately. So now I do the, the hips, because uh, I get a lot of hip problems in elderly people, and integrating in the, the strength too at the same time. So hold it strong and don't let me push, and down. And this one up, and turn it, turn it, hold it strong, and don't let me push. And now the heel shin, so run this up and down your, your shin, okay. And the other one, okay. Point your feet upwards and don't let me pull down. No, nope. point up, don't let me pull down and push down against my hands. That's good. And then I do sensation. I do two kinds of sensation. I mean, there's all, all sorts you could do. But I, I do pin prick at the feet, mostly looking for diabetic neuropathy or other neuropathies. So I do my sharp end and dull end. And so sharp or dull? Sharp. Sharp or dull? Dull. And sharp or dull? And here. Okay. And then one more sensation is the big toe proprioception because I find that useful, especially in elderly patients who fall, uh, to find out whether they have uh, abnormal proprioception, which would probably go along with a positive Romberg uh, test. So am I moving your big toe up or down? Little movements, not, not big twisting movements, just little movements of the, of the toe. And which one on the side? Yeah. Okay. All right. Up you go. So. Any questions? Any comments? What do you think? Well, we, we have great big pots of these uh, safety pins that aren't reused. So they go in the garbage after they're, uh, they're used. Um, and we buy them in, in bulk. And, and I, I don't see a problem with that. It's not like using your old neurological test pin that you pull out of your lapel and you use on patient after, after patient. Well, now I've done that in, in, the, ex in the interview room. Yeah. That's all part of the, you know, the history and then the cognitive examination and maybe GDS if you're going to do a GDS uh, as well. And then we move on to the physical exam. So uh, you know, I would have done either an MMSE or a MOCA depending on the situation. MMSE, if the patient is clearly demented, MOCA if the patient is probably more in the mild cognitive impairment category. The whole assessment, um, hour and a half, yeah. Because I do a pretty exhaustive history as well, and then the cognitive testing, and then the physical, and then back to the examining, back to the interview room to, to tie things up and, and make a plan, hour and a half. So you're thinking, you know, is this relevant for us in family practice because of the time? Well, I think the physical examination part, I mean, that really only took 10 minutes, didn't it? And yet there was a lot of stuff mixed into that, that examination. Any other questions or comments? Lisa? Yes. yes. So I, and I think in, in the, so the question is around lying and standing blood pressure versus sitting and standing blood pressure. Um, in cases of of real orthostatic hypotension, like the disease, uh, autonomic failure, that disease, I may do it lying, sitting, standing, and the pulse rate lying, sitting, standing, because that's, that's an important factor too. Is there a compensatory increase in the pulse rate as the blood pressure is, is dropping, which would be a good normal thing to, to see? Um, but the actual definition of orthostatic hypotension is a 20 millimeter drop from sitting to standing. If you, do you mean from lying to, from sitting to standing? From sitting to standing, there's supposed to be a minute in between. So if you're concerned about do you meet the official criteria for orthostatic hypertension, the official criteria are 20 millimeters with a, after standing for one minute. Um, but if you're just doing two readings, uh, I don't think there's any specified interval that you have to wait between two sitting readings. Yeah. 
I guess that I, that's right. And, and I think theoretically you should, if you really wanted to do this right, you should take the cuff off the arm and then put it back on to let the venous pooling effect uh, uh, go away. But uh, you know, I'm talking about your everyday physical exam. I'm talking about something that we can pull out and use on a daily basis and, and not on special situations. And, and you know, I, I'm, I, I didn't get into Kussmaul breathing or anything uh, like that. This is, this is the everyday physical.